controversial from the 1950s up to the period of Nigeria's independence in 1960. With all the attendant concerns of the 60s, also there were issues with the 1979 and 1989 elections. Tito for the 1999 till date. Are elections in Nigeria impossible to execute to the point of general acceptance? Or are the stakeholders responsible for the quality of elections being held in Nigeria? This is the Eastern Eye. I am Alex Obodo. Welcome to the Eastern Eye on Afia Television. Here, a program that x rays the political, social, and economic developments in Southeast Nigeria and beyond. Since 1999, stakeholders in Nigeria's electoral management haven't covered themselves in glory, a situation many analysts believe is responsible for the festival of election related court cases currently unfolding in various tribunals across the country. Who are these actors influencing and affecting the outcome of elections in Nigeria, for either good or bad? My guests tonight are Barrister Emma Sobona. He is a constitutional lawyer and the executive director of the Center for Nonviolence and Social Justice. He is joined tonight by Sir Abuchi Anuyagu, a veteran journalist. Gentlemen, thank you so much for joining me on the Eastern Eye. Thank you, Alex. So I'll start with you, Barrister Amos Bonai. INEC cannot conduct elections in a vacuum. Who are those inevitable partners in election management in Nigeria? The partners are the government and the politicians. It is the government that provides the necessary funding for INEC to discharge its functions. It is the government that, that provides the enabling environment for INEC to discharge the functions. And that government is talking about federal and state governments. So these are the critical stakeholders in all issues of election management. Because of course, if the fund is not provided, there's nothing INEC can do. So INEC depends on government largely for the funds, in fact, totally for the funds. And so when the funds are available, it is now INEC that has the responsibility to give, to plan, execute, and manage the elections. And the failure in these three critical areas is quite uh, squarely on INEC. If, I, if there's a failure in the electoral management, in organization, in the administration, in collection of results, it is INEC that is to blame. Because INEC has the functions to now recruit uh, resident, uh, uh, resident commissioners or ad hoc staff that work at every polling unit. INEC also has resident commissioners in each state that help with the administration of INEC, especially the issue of electoral management. So the recru recruitment process from top to bottom is that of INEC. Uh, remembering that INEC leadership and the lead leadership of resident commissioners across the states are from government. So it is the government from, this, from the presidency to the National Assembly that appoints the INEC chairman and, of course, the resident commissioners. So these are critical stakeholders, which I could compartmentalize as um, primary stakeholders. Then we also have judiciary. Judiciary comes into play when there is a failure of expectation or where any group or any person feels dissatisfied with the outcome of the electoral process then that's what a person can approach the judiciary for a determination of one or two issues. But the principal thing is that it is not the job of the judiciary to handle electoral matters. It is the job of the INEC. INEC has the constitutional responsibility 
to manage elections and to produce results through a fair and credible process. It is only when an egg phase in, this, in these issues that a recourse is hard to the court. And people now expect the court to do the magic that INEC could not do. So the court only comes into play to look at the issues presented before them and then determine it one way or the other. But the primary responsibility in electoral management is that of INEC. If INEC does what is right, then there will be less pressure on the judiciary and there will be, of course, less recourse to the judicial process. All right. Thank you for opening it for us that way. Uh do you have anything different to say? Because obviously, INEC cannot declare somebody a winner if the person did not come forward to stand for elections. There are people that must come on board for an election to take place. So, what is it? What's your take on this whole analysis? <clears throat> yeah, uh, thank you. The, my uh, co panelist here has uh, dealt uh, more on who are the stakeholders in the election. But beyond uh, what he has said, uh, there are so many other uh, factors or other elements that are stakeholders in the conduct or in any electoral process. Uh, apart from the electoral manager, which is the umpire, call it here in our own country, the independent National Electoral uh, Commission. Uh, you have uh, the political parties, with, because uh, if when the electoral election managers they present the processes for election, and if there are no political parties to participate in that election, of course there will be no election, because the the constitution says before you vie for any elective position, public position in Nigeria, you must, sorry, you must go through a, a political platform. And that political platform is a recognized uh, political party. So the political parties, they are stakeholders in election. Then the participants, the, the, the candidates for election, they are also um, uh, stakeholders in election. Then you talk about the critical mass. The critical mass because no no candidates, no candidate uh, decides or determines his or her fate if the electorate did not come out to exercise their franchise. And how do they exercise their franchise? Is by voting. Because it is the major stakeholders, the major stakeholders in any election are the, they are the electorate, the people that decide, because they own the election. It is the election to elect people to govern them, to elect people to represent them, because they have surrendered their sovereignty to those people that will be elected to pilot the affairs, their own affairs, because uh, it is not every Tom, Dick, and Harry that will be at the, for instance, at the executive arm of government to execute projects, to execute matters that, that, that will be for the benefit, for the interest of the, the, the people. So the electorate, they are very, very important stakeholders in election. And then, going further, you have people you call observers in election. They are independent. They are not aligned to any of these uh, uh, gladiators, either INEC or the political parties, or even the candidates. Their job is to monitor the conduct of the election and then come out with their observation, with their report, to say, the election, whether the election went well or the election did not go well, it is their duty. The Constitution allows them that. The Electoral Act permits them, these independent observers. That is why in the, in the last election, for instance, we heard, you know, independent observers or international observers like the EU 
which later presented their report. You have the ECOWAS, they have their own group that came and represented them, even the AU, the African Union, and then the, the civil society organizations. They, are, they form the bulk of the, the, the independent observers in, in, in an election. And they are very, very important. Their opinion is very, very important because they, uh, they go about the, the, their monitoring of the election without uh, bias, without uh, being guided or dependent on either the government, the independent National Electoral Commission, the electoral body, or even the political parties or the candidates. But they are there to ensure that the election is conducted under free and fair atmosphere, without any bias against any anybody. So you have so much, you know, stakeholders. You, we have talked about uh, the, the managers of the election, that is uh, the Independent uh, National Electoral Commission in the case of Nigeria. Then you have uh, the political parties that will present their candidates for the, for, the people, for the people to make their choice among the candidates. And then you have the electorate, which is the critical mass the people that deter determine the fate of the candidates, the people that we decide, look at the person that we want to govern us, look at the persons that we don't want to govern us one, for one reason or the other. And the, beyond all these other uh, stakeholders I have mentioned, you now have the, the security organizations that will ensure that during the conduct of the, ele the election, there is pre peace and orderliness, peace and tranquility, because you, you, you cannot rule out the fact that some people might not try to do things that could trigger off uh, uh, disorderliness. So you have people that will be there to ensure that there is peace and orderliness. And that is why, during the conduct of the election, you see security personnel being deployed to the polling booths to ensure adequate security. So all these people aggregate them together. They form the uh, stakeholders of, uh, 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 in, in any election. And each, is very, each group is very, very important. Is it the managers of the election, the, the election, the people that will provide the, 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 pro, the processes, which is because uh, the independent uh, electoral body represents the government. It is the government that funds them. It is the government that appoints and even employs people that are going to be there. So they represent the government, which provides the financial resources for the conduct of the, the, the election. Then the electorate, they are very important. The political parties, they are very important. The independent uh, uh, observers, they are equally very important, as well as those that will provide the All security. Right. Okay. And then in addition to the aftermath of the election, where you have aggrieved parties, and when you have aggrieved, aggrieved parties, it is not the government that is the electoral umpire through INEC or the political parties that are in contention that will be the adjudicators in election matter. There will be an independent body that should adjudicate to say one way or the other, we have looked at these cases, we have looked at your grievances, but we have discovered that it went in favor or it should be in favor of A or, or B. So these, uh, all these uh, uh, people, all these okay. elements, they make up uh, the uh, stakeholders in an election. All right, thank you so much. Uh, Barrister Obona, some analysts are arguing that the politicians seem to be one of the very pivotal segment of this stakeholdership we have, Nigeria's election management, that they are the ones, the most part, that really affect the elections 
more than every other person. One, they stand for election. Two, they are the ones that will file candidates and uh, submit all papers and everything that are tendered in court. So the argument is that they are the ones responsible for either high or low quality in the outcomes. Do you believe that the politicians should bear the brunt of the quality of elections we've had? Yes, of course. I will describe them as critical stakeholders in the electoral process because um, the, the, everything about the election is, is about the politicians. Election is about, you know, selecting those who represent the people, both at the national and state levels. So, and these people that will represent the people are the politicians. And so, they determine the political process or the electoral process at any given time. It is the quality of politicians that we have that will determine the quality of electoral process that we have. Where politicians are corrupt and have no regard for law and order and due process, it will reflect in the electoral process. And that is exactly what we have found in Nigeria. There, there are electoral laws that should guide the electoral process and then you see politicians trying to boycott or short-circuit short, short these laws or procedures during the election. You see politicians trying to influence voters through food buying, through intimidation, through harassment, through, in fact, a, a, a disruptive uh, a, a interruptions of the system. You see issues of ballot snatching, ballot box snatching, Issues of falsification of results, issues of electoral violence are perpetrated by politicians. And then where there is no strong institution to be able to check these infractions, then you see it becomes a reoccurring decimal at all electoral cycles. The same politicians will do the same thing over and over again because there is no repercussion for the ones they have done before. And that affects the electoral process. But in senate climes where there, is strong, there are strong institutions and laws are obeyed, and the electoral process is run in, 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 in a manner that conforms with the established standard, you see that there is less friction and there is less controversy in the electoral process. Unlike what we find in Africa, where politicians try as much as possible to influence the process, to contaminate the process, to, in fact, bend the process in such a way that it will favor them, and then push the rest to the court. Like we have seen in the last election, when people were expressing their discontent, what they were told was to go to court. I know that it's supposed to be an independent umpire did not take his time to investigate some of these infractions that were reported. But they rather said, go to court if you're not satisfied. So politicians are largely responsible for the quality of any electoral process we get in any country. Because they are the active participants, and they are the ones who have the resources to influence the system one way or the other. And they also have the capacity, which they often deploy, to even engage non-state actors to undercut or undermine the electoral process. So when we are talking about stakeholders and the electoral uh, management in Nigeria, it is important we look into the issue of the conduct of politicians, and how this conduct can be regulated by law, and how we can formulate strong institutions to bring these conducts, irregular conducts of politicians to account, so that the confidence of the people in the electoral process can be restored. It is lack of confidence of the people in the electoral management that is responsible for low turnout of voters that we have witnessed over the years, since 1999. If you look at the last election, 
that we have had in February and March this year, you see that out of the millions of registered voters we have, only 24.97 million voters actually registered. That constitutes about just 29% of the entire registered voters with, um, uh, the, the, with, with electoral card, voters card. And now, that means that only less than three Nigerians out of 10 actually voted. That is voters' apathy. And this voters' apathy, what is responsible is the way electoral process is managed. Our electoral management system is very poor. Because every time voters get to the polling units, either the, the materials are not delivered on time, or politicians come with talks and unspeakable violence to terrorize the voters. And that makes it very difficult for the voters to believe the outcome of such elections. All right. Because when they are not given a free and equal opportunity to exercise their franchise, and they are, they, are, they, they are compared or constrained to exercise that franchise under an atmosphere of terror, fear, and trepidation, then such, certainly the outcome of such electoral process can never be trusted by the people. Right. And that is why we have general discontent in each electoral cycle. And that is what the electoral managers have to work on. All right, thank you so much. We'll take a break. When we'll come back, we will talk about the political parties and INEC. How have they fared in this their relationship that is getting us all talking here in Nigeria? Stay with us. means of course trading has now opened on the floor of the Nigerian exchange in Lagos, Abuja and at the Onitsha exchange. My name is Nnam Diobaya and this is Opening Bell. Television reaching you last Nigeria with me, Alex Obodo. Sabuchaneyago, the political parties, INEC, the judiciary. This is a tripod that has become very pivotal in the management of our elections. If you lose that election, you go to court. You don't go to INEC. And that what can INEC do, at least on the interim, to make sure that not every single thing that happens during the election ends up in court. Shouldn't INEC be able to sort out some of the small problems instead of everything being thrown at the judiciary? If uh, I, people don't show up for the election on time and materials don't arrive on time, you go to court. And the venue of the election had to shift for a few inches, you go to court. Is everything that happens in an election, is it something that must be tried at the courts? What is actually the remedial role of INEC in this whole thing? Uh, what what uh, that shows is uh, a failure of responsibility. Because uh, INEC is vested with the responsibility of management or conduct of elections. But where they fail, you now begin to see this content. You now begin to see agitation and distrust. So, and they fail because they, they, they give access to desperate politicians to manipulate them and through them manipulate the system one way or the other against the laws stipulating the process of, uh, uh, of any election. So the, the, the number of cases, you know, 
post-election cases pending in, in court, it speaks volumes about the conduct of that particular election. It shows that, the, like what we have at hand presently, a situation where you have about 400 cases in court, it doesn't speak well of the electoral management, of the electoral manager. It shows that if there is a failure, abysmal failure of the electoral body in the conduct of the election. Otherwise, you wouldn't have uh, had so much uh, grievances all over. Virtually all the elections that INEC conducted, is it uh, the state assembly election? Is it the national assembly election? The governorship election? Sorry, or even the presidential election? There is none without any complaint of foul play, any complaint of shoddy dealings, of compromise on the part of INEC. And I think INEC, they have uh, seen the situation uh, with the, the country that it is always very, very difficult for any aggrieved party, any aggrieved person to prove one's case at the court, to prove your grievance at the court. So INEC will now be at liberty to behave the way they, they like, which goes contrary to the electoral law, which goes contrary to even the constitution of the, of the country. And that is why they audaciously, or even if I may say, impudently say you can go to court, because they know that it will be very difficult for you, as we have seen so far, pertaining as it pertains to the presidential election petitions, as it pertains to National Assembly election petitions in various states. So they have seen that it, it will be very, very difficult for any complainant to prove the person's case. They now do whatever they do that runs contrary to the law. Otherwise, if they do the right thing, if they, are, uh, they have that willpower, they are sincere enough to resist any attempt to compromise their integrity in the conduct of election, they are, the, 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 the number of uh, post-election cases will, uh, will uh, reduce. But from every indication, instead of reducing, INEC keeps getting worse every day with every, every election. Where you think that they are going to improve, they will not. Take, for instance, INEC went about before the last general election, assuring people, giving people the hope, the confidence that they were going to be transparent in the transmission of election results, that they were going to follow the ICT, they were going to use the, the, the ICT uh, process to transmit results which will not be uh, uh, subjected to any, any mutilation or any manipulation. But in the end, INEC just simply deceived the people, deluded the people, and the people believed them. They even went beyond the shores of this country. They went to Britain, to Chatham House, to insist that they were going to follow that electronic transmission process of election results. But at the end of the day, they didn't keep their words. And they resorted to telling people, you know, audaciously and impudently to go to court because they know that at the end of the day, they, INEC, will frustrate you from getting, from obtaining justice at the court. And it happened that they blocked, they prevented the, the complainants, the aggrieved parties from, you know, having access to those uh, election materials, to those election processes, you know, which now frustrated uh, their, their cases. And in the end, they, some of them found it very difficult to prove their, their, their allegations of uh, foul play, the allegations of, uh, of uh, manipulations against them in favor of uh, one party or the other in the, in, in the election. So it shows that INEC, they have failed in their responsibilities, in their duties, which they swore 
to uphold. They gave the people hope and they failed the people at the same time. So it, it is uh, because uh, the politicians are very, very desperate. You know, they are very desperate. So they want to win, win in quote. They want to win at all costs. And being that desperate to win at all costs, it leads them to doing uh, illegitimate things. Like my, my brother here said, you know, things like uh, engaging in uh, resorting to election uh, violence to intimidate or to subdue your, your, your opponent and then gain a, a supremacy. It, I, at the end of the day, they say the end justifies the means. You know, I, I have seen a case in, 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 in the past when during my coverage of, of, of the election uh, uh, process, where a candidate said, just declare me the winner. Declare me the winner and forget about the court. I will handle the issue of court. And in the end, he was declared the winner and he, the, 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 aggrieved, the aggrieved party went to court and didn't obtain justice. They, you know, or, or a verdict was, uh, was, uh, was uh, given, judgment was given, but in favor of the man that said, declare me the winner and forget about uh, the court issue. Okay. And it happened like that because INEC failed in their responsibilities to do the right thing. All right. Uh, Barrister Emma Sobona, of what use is the Electoral Act if people will not comply with it, if INEC will not comply with it, if the politicians will not comply with it? Because a lot of the cases that have been either thrown out or decided for or against anybody always cite non-compliance with the Electoral Act. Of what use is that act if collectively people don't want to comply with it? And how is this affecting the fidelity of our elections? What? I cannot say that INEC is not complying with the Electoral Act. The problem with the Electoral Act is that it is couched in ambiguous phrases. For instance, in the, on the issue of electronic transmission of results, the Electoral Act says that INEC shall adopt any process or procedure it deems fit to transmit results from the polling booths. That's the provision of the Electoral Act. But then, INEC now, on their own, in exercise of the powers conferred on them by the Constitution and the Electoral Act, now developed a guideline that now say they will transmit results electronically, real time, from polling booths. But when the chips were down, INEC did not follow their guideline. And now in court, the court is telling us that INEC guideline is not the law. It's not binding on INEC. It's not binding on political parties. It's not binding on anybody. It's just a guideline. And when you look at the hierarchy of laws, the Constitution of the Federal Republic of Nigeria, indeed any constitution of any country, is an autonomous instrument. It's, we call it, uh, it's, it's the highest law. Now, followed by laws made by the National Assembly, followed by the laws made by the State Assembly, and then the local government bylaws. So in the hierarchy of laws, if the law made by the National Assembly is in conflict with the Constitution, the Constitution pervades. If, the, if a, a, an institution like INEC makes a guideline, in the instance of the powers conferred on it by an act of the National Assembly or the Constitution, that guideline ought to be followed strictly because it is a template you have set for yourself. It's, 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 a guide, it's like a rule of conduct you have set for yourself. So not abandoning by it is immoral. But the question is, is it illegal? And the court is saying that as long as that guideline is not in the Electoral Act, it's not binding on INEC. And so non-performance non, non of INEC, according to its guideline, that is non-transmission of 
uh, results electronically is not sufficient enough to nullify the election. That, is, that remains the law until the Supreme Court decides otherwise. If the Supreme Court adopts this reasoning, it now follows that the guideline is of no use in, in, in any electoral process and that whatever is not in the Electoral Act, we should just forget about it. Because if you look at it strictly, if a law empowers an institution like INEC to develop a guideline, that guideline should be binding on INEC. Because nobody developed the, uh, the, the, the guideline for INEC. It wasn't the National Assembly, it was INEC itself. Having looked at the facilities at its disposal, now came to the conclusion that they can and that they will transmit electronically. So failure to transmit electronically, having assured the whole world, even in London, that you are going to make sure that you transmit electoral results electronically. INEC should not be allowed by law to depart from his own guideline and by his own, for, by his own commitment to the people of Nigeria. That is fraudulent. But since the court has decided otherwise, there's nothing we can do. Well, the Supreme Court hasn't decided. Yes. We'll, we'll it wait, it we'll remains the law now happens. until the Supreme Court decides. decides. And I hope the Supreme Court will not follow that line. Mm. Because it will, it, will, it will be unfortunate development for our development. I will get your thoughts on that. We need to go on a break. When we we'll come back, I will come to you, Sabuche and Ayago. In addition to that thought you want to share, we'll find out what Nigeria must do to restore the confidence of the electorate in future elections. Stay with us on the Eastern Eye. trading has now opened on the floor of the Nigerian Exchange in Lagos, Abuja, and at the Onitsha Exchange. My name is Nnamdi Obaya, and this is Opening Bell. Television reaching you live. Jara with me, Alex Obodo. Saibu Chaneago, what must we do to have that election that will inspire confidence? It, it looks like because at the end of the day, Nigerians work in INEC, Nigerians join political parties, Nigerians stand for elections, Nigerians are in the legislative arm, Nigerians are in the executive arm, Nigerians ultimately will be the ones to take that decision. And what are those decisions we need to take as a people to make sure that our elections are something we can look at on playback? We'll have a 12-hour judgment from the PEPT last week. Can you sit down and watch that judgment again? Can we sit back and watch the elections we hold year in, year out? Um, thank you, Alex. Uh, I, I have always uh, said that uh, Nigeria has become uh, very interesting and amazing. Like uh, late uh, Senator Chobo Akadibu, when both of us were having a, a private uh, discussion in his house when he was alive, uh, before uh, 1999, we were interacting. And he said, look, Abuchi, uh, that so, so, so thing, that it is, it is like the beginning, that Yes, he said the statistics. He said, Abuchi, statistics is like the beginnings. Because what the bikini reveals is very interesting. And what the bikini hides is equally interesting or very amazing. So Nigeria, as it is today, has gotten to that level of being like the bikini. What it hides 
is very interesting. And what it reveals is equally very interesting and amazing. Otherwise, we wouldn't be having all these uh, 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 spectacle of, uh, of uh, if I may call it a thriller over uh, election uh, matters, over election issue. And uh, before I delve into the uh, 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 question you asked, the way forward, what should be the, provision, the, the solution to the problem? My brother here touched on the issue of INEC. As I said earlier, that they didn't keep their, their words. In law, I know that your word, your pronouncement, what you say may hold against you under the law. So what I make, yes, the electoral law says that they have, they are at liberty to transmit the election result, elect, to transmit election result through any process you know, that they would prefer. And then, based on that law, they came out and assured Nigerians that they were going to uh, transmit the uh, results of election on the spot via electronic uh, system, the ICT system. And Nigerians believe them. So that word, even though it is a guideline, it is derived, it was derived, that, de that guideline was derived from the provision of the law. And since it was derived from the provision of the law, it should be law. It should not be, you, you, you should not, there, there, there shouldn't be any, any lacuna or any loophole for anybody to escape that, yes, the law didn't stip, stipulate maybe the, uh, uh, the ele the, uh, that election result will be transmitted electronically or not. But having provided the rules that says they have the right, they are at liberty to choose the, the system to transmit the election results, and they have, based on that law, decided and said, Nigerians, look at the way we are going to go. So it should hold against them for reneging on that guideline, for reneging going against that, that uh, 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 their, their words, because it's like going against the law. So that is my own position about, on, on, on that. The, 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 the judiciary shouldn't have uh, you know, decided to defend INEC, to assume the, the, the position of defense counsel by saying that INEC, you could not hold them by their words. No, their words were derived from the provisions of the Electoral Act. Now to the issue of a solution, the way forward. The way forward is by everybody. Because you keep making laws, you keep making laws, because I'm sure by the time of the next election, the National Assembly will now look at the present electoral uh, act and uh, see areas where they can uh, make review for all in a bid to, uh, to ensure free and fair election. But as it is today, what matters is the mind of the people. The attitude in our change. If we decide to see election as what it is and not a matter of desperation, and not, not, not a matter of do or die, that it must be you. Whether the people like you or not, that they will like me. Once we change that attitude, there is attitudinal change, then things will begin to, 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 to go well okay. as it pertains to election in Nigeria. Otherwise, even if you, you make so many stringent laws, Nigerians, people will still find one way or the other to circumvent it. Right. They will still create loopholes. They will still find loopholes to circumvent it and thereby sustaining the, the grievances, sustaining the acrimony that goes after the conduct of every election. All right. Thank you so much. Uh, Barrister Obunna, I'm sure you have a few things to say on that. And I also want you to tell us what we must do about our laws. Because it looks like when people say they are finding loopholes in the Electoral Act, 
Well, someone might jokingly ask, <laughs> is the electoral act full of holes? But I mean, um, that's not what it is about. But tell us exactly what should be done to that electoral act. Now that we have a new National Assembly, is, is now the time to tinker with it one more time? Yes, we will always tinker with it because, of course, the, the society evolves continually and um, laws also evolve with society. Nothing is constant. And if you check the European Union, uh, uh, European Union Observers report on the last election, they made a suggestion that we should streamline our laws and remove areas of ambiguity. Areas of ambiguity. Now, you are, uh, is the Electoral Act is telling INEC to go and adopt any method they didn't fit. How can Electoral Act leave a matter of the issue of electoral tra tra transmission of results in such a vague and ambiguous uh, template. You should go and adopt whatever method they didn't fit. Now, they've adopted, adopted a method they didn't fit through a written guideline which says they will adopt electronic transmission. To me, that guideline is binding on INEC and every stakeholder in the electoral process. Because if you check section 46 of the 1999 Constitution, uh, which empowers the Chief Justice of Nigeria to develop the procedure for the enforcement of fundamental human rights in chapter 4 of the 1999 Constitution, that is the section empowering the CJN to develop a procedure for enforcement of fundamental human rights, to make it alive, to make it functional for the benefit of Nigerians for which that chapter four was created. And what did the Chief Justice of Nigeria did? The Chief Justice of Nigeria now formulated a procedure, what we call fundamental human rights procedure law. Can you say that it's not law? Because it is not in the constitution. The constitution already empowers the, the Chief Justice of Nigeria to develop a procedure and he has developed the procedure. That procedure can to bind everybody that intends to enforce or go to court to enforce anything pertaining to human rights. No, the same thing applies to INEC. When the law empowers INEC to develop its own guideline or procedure for electoral management, and it develops a procedure through a guideline, saying that it will now transmit results electronically, that guideline is binding. And I hope that the Supreme Court will save this country from that injurious judgment that emanated from the Court of Appeal. That's so, uh, as a matter of fact, we need to tinker with our laws continually. We have seen areas where there are loopholes. The National Assembly has an obligation now to look at how we can safeguard the sanctity of our electoral process from the polling booth. And the only way which gave us so much hope is electronic transmission. Because by the time this result leaves the polling booth to a collection center, that is when all manner of manipulations begin. That is when the governors and all manner of stakeholders now collapse on the, on, on the, on the procedure of election and electoral collection right. and then begin at all times Thank you. to falsify result, to change result and all that. And then the court will eventually tell you that you did not prove your allegation beyond reasonable doubt. That's a good place to leave it. Barrister Amos Obuna, a constitutional lawyer and the executive director of the Center for Nonviolence and Social Justice. Thank you so much for your thoughts on the program. And Sir Abu Chani Yago, thank you so much for your perspectives on the Eastern Eye tonight. That's it for the Eastern Eye tonight. Thank you for watching. My name is Alex Obodo. Up next is Nka with Jumai.